Please turn the pages of your Bibles to Second Samuel 7. Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time I brought you, brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, when even to this day, but have moved about in the tent in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, I have ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel who I commanded the shepherd, my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took from the sheepfold, from the following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I have made you a great name, like the name of a great man who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a place for of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them as previously. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people, I have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also the Lord tells you that he will make a house when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. According to all these words, according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God, and you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the manner of Men, O Lord God, now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. For your word's sake, and according to your own heart, you have done all these great things to make your servant know them. Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard in our ears. Who is like your people, like Israel, one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people to make for himself a name and to do for yourself great himself a name and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nations, and their gods. For you have made your people Israel 
your very own people forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. Know, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said. So let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel, and let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have relieved this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house, therefore your servant has found in his heart to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised this goodness to your servant. Now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue before you forever. For you, O Lord God, have spoken it with your blessing. Let the house of your servant be blessed forever. Thank you. It's always refreshing to hear other voices from the front than your own. Thank you. So we are continuing our eight-part series, Your Kingdom Come. And here we are in this two-parter in our series called The King Chooses Israel. I want you to turn your Bibles quickly to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. Now, Matthew was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ during the three years of his earthly ministry. And in this very Jewish account, he begins his gospel with the following words. If you look at there, verse 1. Now, some of you remember this um, from in preparation for the Christmas season last year. We actually, one of our sermons was on this very verse. In Matthew chapter 1 verse 1, we read these words. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now in this one verse, he beautifully summarizes not only the genealogical history of the nation of Israel, but he skillfully surmises the redemption history of the whole of the Old Testament. If you want to sum up the whole of the Old Testament in one verse, it's this verse. And this actually serves a purpose for us this morning. Because while I was preparing, because we've had some lengthy sermons of late, haven't we? Um, while I was preparing this message, I was sweating and dreading thinking how am I in one sermon and try to keep it so it's not overly long going to summarize the whole of the Old Testament in one message what format should I use and this is what hit me while I was preparing and being reminded of this verse I think it gives a good structure for anyone who would want to give an overview of the whole of the Old Testament. And I think this is biblically wise as well, an example we should follow. So our subheadings this morning, or our message, is going to follow these three headings. Very simple. Abraham, David, the exile. That's it. Abraham, David, the exile. So far in our series, Your Kingdom Come, our attempt to understand the grand narrative of the Bible and demonstrate how the biblical story forms the foundations of a proper Christian worldview. What we're trying to say is this. By the end of this series, we are hoping that our minds are shaped biblically in how we understand reality, how we understand truth, how we understand right and wrong, good and evil, how we are to understand life. And it's so sad that many people go to church, but they do not have a biblical worldview. 
The world worldview speaks for itself. It's how you view the world. Here's what happens with many people. We go to church on a Sunday morning, we get our touch of religion, but come Monday to Saturday, you do your own thing. I've heard people, I've counseled people, I've engaged Christian ministers who say stuff like, well, you know, I know the Bible says that, Pastor, but, you know, our culture says this. You don't have a Christian worldview. You You know, we know the Bible says that, but, you know, the times were in 2020, and so it means we've got to do this. You don't have a Christian worldview. When the Bible says, well, this is what happened in creation, and you say, well... Even though we don't have the proof, we've got to believe all these scientists, well, evolutionary scientists, with all these little letters after their names, because they've got all those little letters after their names, it means, you know, they must be right. You don't have a Christian worldview. And the problem with the world is that it doesn't have a biblical worldview. So man is eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We are choosing to do our own thing. We're living a self-autonomous life. And the the purpose of this series is over these eight weeks, is to try and provide for us, and the hope is this, we're not going to do all the work for you because there's lots of information we're leaving out. We're hoping you will go away and want to delve more into the Bible, want to study more, want to understand more, but more importantly, through transformation of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, want to live a life unto God. But for us as Christians, our hope is this, is that we form a biblical worldview that brings us to the place where we adopt a kingdom mindset and understand we are citizens of God's kingdom. Our church gatherings are embassies, You and I are ambassadors. We need to live that kind of a life. And so far in our series, we've seen the Bible from the beginning presents God as the good creator king who made the heavens and the earth. And all of this, the Bible tells us, was very good. We've also seen that man was the height of God's creation. And human beings were created to be God's under kings, his vice regents, to represent him on earth. Why? Because Genesis 1 verse 26 to 27 says, we are made in God's image. Now, that, that traditionally, we always interpret that to mean, you know, we can relate to him, etc., which is true. But primarily, it means to rule in his place on earth as his proxy. We're not God's. Some people teach this, it's heretical, it's from the pit of hell. We are not little gods. Yeah, can I get another, some more amens? We're not little gods. The Bible makes that distinction. There's one God, you and I are not gods, we're human beings. And there's nothing wrong with being a human being. And God has wanted to rule through man. And the two things he wants in this, and you see it in the temple garden of Eden. That's the point of, of Eden. He wants man to bring in his kingdom and to worship him as priests. That was the purpose of Adam and Eve. We've also seen that man was to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Man was to thrive, explore, discover, build, all of these things, be creative. We see it in life. That's why we say to you, enjoying the arts, engineering, I love engineering, um, medicine, all of these things. This is part of us discovering, subduing the earth, building dams and lakes and all of these things. This is what God has given to us, intelligence. This is a good thing. These are good. And what we find established for us is that in the original creation, All was well between God and humans, man within himself, human to humans, and humans in creation. Just like this picture shows, all was good, all was well. God had created an order as to how man was to live. There were distinctions. A man is a man, a woman is a woman, 
and the institution that God established was the marriage and the family were to flourish that way. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 are the basis and the foundation for human flourishing. However, because of sin, due to man's desire to be self-autonomous, man wanted to be God, wanted to rule himself, he wanted to redefine the terms, he entered into a state of death. We saw this in Genesis chapter 3. Worse, all of creation entered into a state of corruption. We know this. Romans chapter 8 reminds us, all of creation does what? Groans. It's waiting for all things to be renewed. And this relationship became corrupted. Because of the broken relationship, remember, the meaning of death is not just physical death. We saw this, didn't we, in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. Death truly is when man is disconnected from his God, from his creator. And because he's disconnected from his creator, guess what? All the other relationships are corrupted as well. That's why man has battle within him. I've said this and I'll repeat it. You can leave a person alone in a room and you still have problems. Because he's broken. And because he's broken, he's broken his relationship with other human beings. We see it in marriages, don't we? We see it in sibling relationships. We see it in the church. And we see it man's broken relationship with creation all this around him. God graciously provided a plan of rescue even after this, Genesis 3.15. We said the rest of the Bible is the unpacking of Genesis chapter 3.15. God preached the gospel himself. He made a way of escape. He made a plan to bring about a del- deliverance for man. God took the initiative, came seeking man, provided a way out, the promise of the seed that will bring relief to all mankind. However, man was exiled from the garden. Keep note of that. He was what? He was exiled. He was kicked out of the garden, God's temple garden. And he experienced the devastating effects of sin. Separation from God, restlessness within himself, broken relationship with other humans, and an adverse relationship with all of creation. And this state of death and corruption continued. Remember, the very first human being born of a woman, Cain, was a murderer. That's you and me. We saw the, the, the continued corruption and the chaos of the flood in, in the time of Noah. And we saw last week, didn't we, that the greatest demonstration of rebellious pride was at the Tower of Babel when man declared himself God. When man sought to make a name for himself, when man sought to, to exalt himself, when man sought to look God in the eye. God had to slap down that rebellion, didn't he? But now, in response to the catastrophe of Babel, the high water mark of sin in the first 11 chapters of the Bible, God's, this, this rebellion in God's good creation... God takes the initiative once more and turns his attention to one man, Abraham. Indeed, Abraham and his descendants are the major concern of the rest of the Old Testament and more concentrated, the rest of Genesis. So first of all, let us consider God calls a man, Abraham or Abraham, Now, we don't need to go back over it. Remember Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3? Turn your Bibles there, please. Genesis chapter 12. We've got selective passages this morning. We are going through the whole of the Old Testament, so... I should have told you all to bring your lunch with you. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Now, I want you to look at this. I think, for our purposes, it would be... Important that I read it quickly. Listen to this. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. 
so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So by narrowing his focus on Abraham, it raises the question, does it not? Has God given up on all the other nations? No. The answer is no. You see, the biblical principle is established. Again, back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God works through a man. He started with Adam. He messed up. They thought he was going to be Cain. He's a murderer. Then he wiped everything out, left eight behind, started with Noah. He was a drunk. Then we saw man continuing in his sin and his pride. And it's all right, if you guys want to do your own thing, go and do your own thing. I'm going to take one nation and through them, I'm going to bring in my kingdom. And to start that, he calls a man Abraham. It's a principle. And that principle is established in Genesis 3.15. Through the seed of the woman, not seeds as in plural, it's singular. The Bible makes it clear, it's singular. Paul in Galatians reminds us of this, singular, seed. But they're all looking, who's the man? Who's the man? They're all looking for the man. Here's what they realize, man is corrupt. Who is going to deliver man? Who's going to bring relief and comfort? But here, God calls a man. And we can see that the first three verses of Genesis 12 spell out for Abraham what God plans to do through him. And the plan is a remarkable one. Here are the things we see in verses 1 to 3. God promises. Look at, your, look at your, those, those verses. And let me just point out a few things very quickly. God promises to do what? To make Abraham into a great nation. Secondly, he says he's going to bless him. Then he says he's going to make his name great. And why? To make him a blessing. And then he's, to, he's going to bless those who bless Abraham and curse, or to be more specific, judge those who judge Abraham. And ultimately, to bless all peoples of the earth through Abraham. So it's narrowed it down to a man, but I think anyone can see, is it limited to the man? No. Is it limited to just his own children? No. There's a blessing that goes way beyond the very bloodline, DNA descendants of Abraham. What we see here, demonstrated in these verses, are God's free gift to Abraham. God's free gift to Abraham. Why do I say this? You see, the people of the earth, in Genesis chapter 11, they sought to make a name for themselves, apart from God. They wanted to make themselves famous by constructing this tower, but God rejected their ambitious plan to do things their way and he disrupted it but you know what's beautiful what Moses does here he contrasts what was happening in Babel with immediately in chapter 12 although they didn't have it as chapter 12 but he contrasts it immediately with what God is now doing with Abraham and he wants you and I to pay attention and say Look what man is trying to do by his own power, but look, look what God does as a free gift to those who he chooses. Have a look. Look at this. In contrast to the plans of man, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, God promises that he, he, not Abraham, he will make Abraham's name great. Do you see that? And make him into a great nation. The very things they were trying to do for themselves in Genesis 11. God says, Abraham, listen, I will do this for you. Free. Which one would you want? I think this is marvelous. 
And the divine irony in this is this. The trophies that the people of Babel attempted to take. They wanted to take. We're going to, we're going to take this glory. We're going to take this fame. We're going to take this for ourselves. What does it remind you of? The garden where they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We will take the throne from God. We will take the authority from God. We will take the autonomy from God. And we will make ourselves kings. The divine irony is that what the people of Babel attempted to take for themselves, fame, security, a heritage for the future, God gives us a free gift to Abraham. The theological point here is this. Here we start to see how God will respond to what has gone wrong in his creation. Through Abraham, he will bring into being a nation, Israel, which is to be God's own people among all the other peoples of the world. And through this nation, God will bring a blessing to all the other peoples of the earth. And we see this in Genesis chapter 18, verse 18 to 19. We read the following words. Seeing that Abraham, this was when God came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he goes to Abraham first, visits him, and tells Abraham what he's planning to do. And he says, you know what? Since Abraham is going to be a very important person, he's going to be the father of nations, the father of faith, it's only right that I inform him of what my plans are. And he says this in Genesis chapter 18, verse 18 to 19. He says, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Now, despite this narrowing of focus, it is clear that God does not forget his purposes for all the nations of the world. This is the mistake people make. The good people... We may disagree theologically on a few points, but I kindly disagree with them in their understanding of God's role through the nation of Israel. This is the climactic conclusion of God's choosing of Abraham to be a blessing to the whole world. This is the point. This is the purpose. Salvation is of the Jews but not exclusive to the Jews. Scripture makes this clear. This is God's answer to the corrupting effect of sin in creation. God will restore his creation. He will restore all things. He started with Adam, messed up. Noah, messed up. Now he's starting again. And establishing this covenant with Abraham to redeem all mankind. And the way God establishes or seeks to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? To, there we go. Sorry. The way God sought to do all of this is to establish a covenant with Abraham. And what we say in theology is this. God's kingdom is administered through covenants. God's kingdom is administered through covenants. In other words, God binds himself to promises that he makes to certain individuals to do certain things. And all of these covenants you find in the main are dependent on who God is and what God alone can do. 
And that's very significant. Take your mind back to Genesis chapter 15 that we read this morning. Thank you, Bobby, for reading that. So God established a covenant with Abraham. And he does so in two phases. The first one is Genesis 15. Cast your mind, if you, don't, if you can't remember, just turn your page to Genesis chapter 15 quickly. I'm not going to read from there. I'm just going to explain what's going on. God comes to Abraham and says, Hey, Abraham, I'm going to make you a very great nation. In fact, your children... And by the way, remember, Abraham was old and had no children. And he thought that one of his servants would be his heir. So God comes to him, childless Abraham, barren wife, and God says, Old man, your children would be like the stars of the sky. You can't count them. If you were Abraham, what would go through your mind? It's a joke. But Abraham showed faith. In fact, it's, this passage is referred to again and again in the New Testament. Abraham looked up and it was credited to him as righteousness. He believed God. He believed God's promise. And Abraham says to the Lord, you're going to give me children, give me the land, etc., etc., but how am I going to know this is going to happen? So God enters into a covenant with Abraham. And he tells him, it's a very dramatic ceremony. God says to him, Abraham, get some animals. And this was something they did commonly in those days in the ancient Near East. So get some animals, cut them in half. The big animals, put one half on this side, the other that side. The birds, they didn't cut up. They just laid it in the middle. And here's what they used to do. In those days, for example, let's say Melissa and I entered into a covenant. Maybe it was on a land or something else. Melissa and I would get together, would get, would get an animal, slaughter the animal, cut the animal in half, lay one piece here, one piece there. Then we would stand together and we would lock arms. And then we would, together we would walk through the animal. And here's what it means. If you or I break this covenant, then we will be cut in two like this animal. It was a serious oath, a serious covenant. And in those days, you know, they didn't play. You would get cut in two or get stoned to death. You made an oath, you broke it, it's your life. So by God entering in the covenant of Abraham, God says, Abraham, cut these animals in two. Abraham does that. What happens? Abraham falls into a deep sleep. He never walks through it. Who walks through it? God alone walks through it in the form of a flaming torch that goes through the middle of the sacrifices and consumes the sacrifices. It's God's way of saying, I and I alone will bring about this covenant. It's a marvelous covenant. Abraham was snoring. This covenant was dependent on the character of God, the person of God, and the power of God alone. Then some time later, God appears to still childless Abraham. He was now 99 years old. No children. Wife still barren. Well, he had, um, what's his name? And God comes again to him and confirms his covenant with Abraham. To say, hey, I've not forgotten, but the promise is not through Ishmael. It's the one that comes out of Sarah, Isaac. So God gave him, again, promise of numerous descendants, Genesis chapter 17, a land for his people, and God himself would be the great king of the nation of his people that would descend from Abraham. And as a mark of that covenant, he gives him the mark of circumcision. And this promise is repeated with Isaac and Jacob and the 12 sons of Jacob. God promises to Abraham are reaffirmed again and again. But sadly, we see in this family of God, bitter breakdown in family relationships. We see them through their own ignorance, disobedience, hardness of heart, jealousy, anger, manipulation. 
They did everything to disrupt God's plan. But you know what we saw? What we see in Genesis? God's providential care of his covenant people in the face of many obstacles that seek to derail God's plan. And ultimately, Jacob's 12 sons, in one particular called Judah, the promise of the king, because God had promised to Abraham and Sarah that out of them would come kings and princesses. And God, through the prophecy of Jacob, says Judah would be that line. And this is quite something. When you're, only, when you're only a few people, about 70 people, you're not much, but God is saying you're going to be a great nation. But even more so, in the promise that he made to Abraham in Genesis 15, he says, your children will be a great nation, but something's going to happen to them. Another nation is going to enslave them for over 400 years. Can you imagine someone telling you that? Your children are going to be slaves for over 400 years. I mean, I'll be going, wait a minute, God, you're God. Why do you want that to happen? Why don't you make another plan? But God says, no, your people are going to be enslaved for 400 years. But I will bring them into that land, and the nation that enslaves them, I will punish them. And that leads us on to the second part of our sermon this morning. David, the king in his dynasty. So the children of Israel are in slavery. Now here's where we're going to go really quick. So you have to pay attention. They're put into slavery. And God comes through Moses, the prophet, to deliver his people in a, a magnificent ceremony called a Passover, they are delivered by putting the blood of the lamb over their doorposts. After the tenth plague, the angel of death comes in to kill, out the, the first, to kill the firstborn of the land. If you didn't have the blood of the lamb over your, your house, that firstborn dies. So they're delivered without no sword, no shield, no fighting. They're delivered from Egypt out of slavery to go into the promised land. And that's what the book of Exodus is about. And they are brought to Sinai in this covenant ceremony again to renew, in a sense, their vow with the Lord as God's people before they enter the land. So they couldn't go straight to, into the land. They had to receive God's word, how they're going to live as God's people, how they're going to worship God, how they're going to worship God and make him known to the Gentiles. They had to come to Sinai first. And they come to Sinai, and we read these words in Exodus chapter 19, verse 3 to 6. Listen to this. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3 to 6. It says, While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Now pay attention to what's next. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. And a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. This is very important. You see, they were to be what? A kingdom, not just the people, notice that. They were to be what? A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's what Adam and Eve were supposed to be and all the rest of them. To live on this earth, to bring in God's kingdom... God's rule and reign, and to be worshippers, to be priests of God, to express His glory in the way they lived out in subduing and ruling over the earth. But sin interrupted all of that. So this people of God are to be His people, people of His kingdom, to worship Him, to bring in His kingdom. And so we find Exodus, the formation of the people, then Leviticus is all about how are we to live as God's people? What do we see in Leviticus? I will be, I will be your God, you will be my people, and right, God, it's the garden again. God living with his people 
kingdom atmosphere in worship of their God. So Leviticus is all about how to live as God's people. How do you live with a holy God without him wiping you out? That's the point of Leviticus. Then Numbers is the journey to the land. Deuteronomy, they're on the border of the land. And Moses says, hey, when you get into the land, because you lot are a bunch of stiff-necked people like your forefathers, stubborn people, I know what you're going to be like. You're going to mess up. But listen to this. When you mess up in that land, you're going to get kicked out, exiled from the land. What does that remind you of? Adam and Eve getting kicked out of the land, right? So that threat is always there. This is what they're supposed to be. God is their king. They're going into the land. Remember, God is your king. You're not like the other nations. God is your true king. You are under him. You're to worship him. If you worship him, life, prosperity, blessing. If you don't, you die. And you get kicked out of the land. That was it. Very simple. That's Deuteronomy. And then Joshua. Oh, man. No, not because he's just my name. No, no. Oh. Ask Pastor Louis. I've been, I've been stressing about this because it's such a rich book. Not because it bears my name, though that's important. But it's really, it's what all these books are in the history of redemption and what their purpose are. It's such a rich book. One day we will do a study on this. Joshua is the gift of the land. It's been given to them. They didn't really have to work for it. It's, it's God's gift to them where they will act out being God's people. And then we come to the book of Judges. Failure to be light to the nations. If you've never read the book of Judges, it's a terrible book because it shows how nasty even God's people are. It's a bad book. They do bad stuff. That's, it's not theological terms I'm using but you understand what I'm saying. They do really bad things. And after seeing all of that, when you read for the book of Judges, after the time of Joshua, you ask the question, is there hope for mankind? If this is supposed to be God's people, where's the hope? Where is the man? And the judges that are raised up are just as wicked as the people they're leading. Because this is how Judges ends. In Judges chapter 21, verse 25, we read these words. In those days... There was no king in Israel. See that? No king. It's not just talking about a physical king. The people did not relate to God as their king. So the writer says, no, there was no king. These people lived as there's no king. There's no ruler. And everyone did what? What was right in God's eyes. Right? Good. They did what? What was right in their own eyes. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you see that tree? That tree's everywhere. That tree's still here today. Man doing what's right in his own eyes. Calling a man woman, a woman a man. And here's a cycle you see. And this is repeated, not just in the time of Judges, but later on, when Israel apostatized. Apostatized is when they abandoned the faith. This is what happens again and again. You, if you read the book of the prophets, and the book of the kings and that, this cycle, memorize it, this, this sums it up. They serve Israel for a while. They have a good leader. Then they have a bad leader. The priests, the prophets are wicked. Then the people themselves turn to idolatry. Then the Lord sends prophets to warn them, repent, turn back. They don't listen. Then what happens? God brings a judgment upon them. Maybe another nation comes in and sacks them. Then they cry to the Lord, oh Lord, we're sorry. And then God graciously brings the deliverance to them. And they serve it again, and it goes round and round and round again. Looks like you and me sometimes, eh? Raises the question again, is there hope? Where, is there a king that can lead his people? Well, guess what? Right after that, look in your Bibles, and it's the same, in, I think, in the Hebrew version. What book do you get after it? The book of Ruth. Here's the thing. Ruth isn't really about Ruth. Do you want to challenge that? There's a man called Eliminech. I can never pronounce it. I think I pronounced it right for the first time. It's about his descendants. And now Ruth becomes the conduit whereby this man's line is continued. By marrying a man called Boaz. 
Boaz's name, by the way, means in him is strength. And he's like a, a type of Christ. And the line of Elimelech is continued through Boaz and Ruth. But at the end of the book of Ruth, whose genealogy do you see? David. King David. It's a wonderful study. The last part of Ruth, the genealogy points to King David. And it sets the scene for the next book. What's the next book after Ruth? Children, you've done this. First Samuel, the book of Samuel, right? And here's the thing. I'm going to help you out. Here's a little secret. This is for free. Costs you nothing. Everything you read from Samuel, Kings, the prophets, all of that, everything from the first book of Samuel to Malachi, all of that can be summed up under the book of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. It all happens. You know, people say, how do you know this happened when you were talking about the prophets? How did you know this happened? It's no secret or magic. You just need to know what's happening in the book of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. It's all there. You don't even need to go and explore and do a research study as well. It's just this book. All you have in the book of the prophets are just an expansion of detailed prophecies under these times. If you want to know what it's all about, read this book. Samuel's, Kings, and Chronicles. Gives you a summary. But all of this... It's about David, the king, and his dynasty. Because what happens is this. What happens is, in the time of David, so in the time of David, David is a great king. First of all, the first king was Saul. He was a naughty king. Didn't do what God wanted. Was too proud. God got rid of him. And said, I've chosen a man after my own heart. Happens to be a shepherd boy called David. God raises him up, becomes king, Especially an amazing event with a, a big giant called Goliath. And that bring, announces him onto the stage before the whole nation. And the point of that battle with Goliath is this. The victory of David becomes the victory of the nation. And that's significant. It's similar to what the greatest son of David would later do. That his victory becomes our victory. So what you find is this. David has a son called Solomon who he had through an adulterous affair. And Solomon becomes king. And after Solomon, the nation is split into two. You had a northern nation and a southern nation. The southern nation was the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. And the northern nation was the other ten tribes. And here's what happened in the northern nation. The dynasty of the kings changed from family to family, from family to family. And nearly all of them were wicked kings. And they got taken into exile 140 years before all Judah did. But here's what happens. In the biblical account, the line of David in Judah does not change once. It never changes. God sustains and maintains David's line. It's never corrupted with another dynasty, with another family. It remains David's sons throughout. And some of those kings were good kings. But in the midst of this, God made a promise. The high point of this period is God's promise to David. We read it, Caitlin read it for us. 2 Kings chapter 7. And that promise in 2 Kings chapter 7 is a development of the coming seed of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Specifically identifying the conquering saviour with the seed of David. It makes the connection. And in the covenant with David, the Lord has revealed that David's son would build a house for the Lord. The temple that would give a more established place for God's holy presence with the nation. Now these promises find their fulfilment in Solomon in real time and the temple in Jerusalem, which we'll read later. But these promises look further than Solomon. What we find in the books of Samuel is a major step towards the fullness of time when God would send forth his son to reign as the son of David and establish God's presence with his church 
in the spirit. That's what all of this is pointing to. And the book of Kings that follows demonstrates that apostasy leads to judgment even as God remains faithful to his covenant promises. And then we come to the book of Chronicles. The book of Chronicles was written after the nation, especially Judah, came back from exile, where they were kicked out, came back from Babylon. Notice that, Babylon. Let that sink in for a moment. So after they come back from Babylon, the people are distraught, and they're saying, we're supposed to be God's covenant people. We're supposed to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. We're supposed to be God's special people. And they came back to the land, and this is under the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And you know what they found? Sand, rubble, no glory. Times of David have gone. Times of Solomon have gone. And the place looked pathetic. Jerusalem looked pathetic. And they asked the question, God, where are you? Habakkuk? Who's read Habakkuk? <laughs> Very few people. Habakkuk is what? Why, oh Lord? Why did we get kicked out? We're your people. Chronicles is a reminder that God is the God who keeps his covenant, keeps his promises. The book of Zechariah also deals with this. And what he has promised, he will bring to pass. So, let's bring all of this together. I will be your God. You will be my people. And I will dwell amongst you. I want to bring to your memory something Pastor Louis, some slides that he used. You need to read the Bible with an ancient Near East mindset, an old Jewish mindset, how people understood their deities, their kings, their people and their land in those days. If you were living in those days, this is your mindset. There's a God, there's a people, there's land, and there's the king. And this is how everything held together. And if any of those parts are missing, you really were nothing. If one of those parts are missing, there's no God, there's no king, there's no land, no real people, then you, you, you kind of, you don't really... You don't exist in any importance. You're not regarded with any importance. And the Bible plays on this as well. Because that's how those people in those days would have read it and understood it. Israel are God's people. They have a king. God is their true king. He's also the one to worship. And they're God's people and he's given them the land. And all of this must hold a healthy balance. But what did we see? What have we seen over and over again? When Israel, here's the lesson, when Israel fails, or God's people fail to worship him, to bring in his kingdom, it falls apart. You and I must have a kingdom mindset, a kingdom worldview. We must as a church live as God's people and Jesus is our true king. Here's our theological point for this morning. Church, God has tied himself to humans. God works through man. This has been his intention and plan from the beginning. And it ultimately, through the man Christ Jesus, that God will restore order to creation. And this man did not just come for Israel. God works through the man. God has not given up on humanity. That's why he sends his son in the form of man. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst people. Say, why did Jesus have to be a man? Because God wants to fulfill his original intention to rule through man. And they were seeking for the man, the seed. Who's the one? And the, ro- the one arrives in the form of the son of God, Jesus Christ, who is God's king, who will draw people for himself. And what does the Bible tell us? He would deliver the kingdom to the Father at the end. But this is not just for Israel. It's not. You'll find people, theologians, want to tell you, well, that's just for the Israel. No, this is for all of us, that we should live today as God's kingdom people, here on earth, representing him. 
But the way that we do that is by what? Obeying his word. Believing in the authority of scripture of our lives. If we were to live as the citizens of the kingdom, we must submit to the authority of the word of God. And we must understand the distinction between God and man. We must adopt a kingdom mindset. And we must adopt this so that we can live the kingdom life. And we only do that by having a biblical worldview. We started our sermon this morning with Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. A very Jewish reference, right? And as the book of Matthew moves along, here's what you see. Slowly, Matthew is moving from just a Jewish context to a wider world context. We know the Lord's Prayer, right? We know the Lord's Prayer. Have you sat down and thought about that prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy what come? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in Israel as it is in heaven. Now, be done on earth. And you will find passages throughout the Old Testament that speaks of God's desire to reach out to the whole nations and how the nations will worship Yahweh. But how does Matthew, who starts his account, a very Jewish reference, how does he end his gospel account? We all know it here at this church. We read it every Sunday. Matthew 28 Verse 18 to 20. He says this. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all Israeli people. <laughs> of who? Of all nations. Teaching them, do what not? Teaching them to observe all that I have. T- Oh, look at you. Baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. That's how it finishes. The second Adam came to testify to the truth. He is God's king over God's people. From every tribe, tongue, people or nation. The king restoring all image bearers of God to worship him in truth and in spirit. That's the Old Testament for you. That's the kingdom theme. There's a quick lesson. There's so much in there we've left out. But I hope you got the gist of it. We must have a biblical worldview. We must have a kingdom mindset. Jesus is our king, our Lord and Savior. If we truly be his disciples, we must surrender and submit to him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Just in a moment of silence in your heart, we encourage you to, to think about your current relationship with the Lord. Whether you're truly submitted to Christ as king. Do you see the world through his eyes? Do you see the world as he intended Are you bringing in his kingdom? Are you being a good priest and worshipping him as he intended? Let's pray for renewal and repentance and for God to work mightily in, in our hearts, individually and as a congregation. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. And all God's people say, Amen Amen indeed.